Okay, in this video, the advanced topic I'd like to talk about is what you do if you have an object that is placed on a surface and that surface is not horizontal. So for example, we have this skier. Um, the mass is given to us at 65.0 kilograms. The skier is initially at rest. If they don't push themselves, what is their acceleration on this frictionless surface? And then the second part of the question, what minimum coefficient of friction would be necessary to hold this skier stationary? So when you start a problem like this, you're going to want to, of course, list your givens and drawing a free body diagram is a way to list your givens when you're talking about which forces do you know you put them on the free body diagram. Um, but at the beginning of a problem like this, you know that you have an object that will potentially be in motion. It's a very good idea to start out as part of your givens with a statement of what direction is positive X, what direction is positive Y. So I've got that on here. Positive X is to the right, positive Y is straight up. That's, uh, that's pretty standard. So then I start going through the problem and I'm looking at it and I'm saying, well, the, the normal force is not in the X direction and it's not in the Y direction. It's not in the positive X or negative X. It's not in the positive Y or the negative Y. It's often this in between, which means there's an X component to it and there's a Y component to it. So it's not that it's not in the X and it's not in the Y. It's that it's not just in the X and it's not just in the Y. So we'll have to break the normal force apart into its X and Y components before we can do any calculations with it. That's not too bad. We can do a little bit of trigonometry. No big deal. Now I'm looking at this problem and I'm realizing when the skier starts accelerating, I know what direction they're going to go. They're going to go down the slope. That means their displacement, their velocity, their acceleration, all of their kinematics is going to be in this direction down the slope, which, like the normal force, has both an X component and a Y component. So we would have to have a X calculation and a Y calculation for the displacement and the velocity and the acceleration. If any other forces are involved in the question, um, for example, friction in the second part of this question, we have friction pointed parallel to the surface um, of contact. But also if you had something like maybe a rope trying to uh, help accelerate this person up the slope or down the slope or anything like that, those forces are very likely to be parallel to the plane of motion. So everything that we're dealing with is going to be parallel to the plane of motion, except the normal force, which is perpendicular to the plane of motion, and gravity, which is pointed straight down. At this point, I want to point out to you that this is a lot of things that are going to have X and Y components. And all of that was dictated by me saying that the x direction is to the right and the y direction is up. But the axes are supposed to be tools that help me to calculate things and they're supposed to be there to make things easier for me. So if there's a way that I can change the axes to put them in a direction that makes it actually easier, that's exactly what I want to do. And that's exactly what you want to do. Anytime you have an object on an incline, the first thing you want to do is identify what is the direction of all the kinematics that's going to happen. Whether the object is moving up the ramp or down the ramp, the ramp surface is probably the direction that all of the kinematics is going to occur for your problem. That line of kinematics, you don't want to have all of the things along there have X and Y components. So you can take your axes that are X and Y as I've drawn right here, you can get rid of them or rather replace them with axes that are tilted slightly. A very good idea is to make the X axis either pointed up or down your incline. It doesn't matter if it's pointed up or if you spin it around and point it down the, the uh, incline itself. All of your motion then is in the X dimension. It's either positive or negative X. Having it point positive x down the ramp is something that I've found a lot of students like to do. I have a tendency to like whichever one is more to the left to be negative and whichever one is more to the right to be positive. So in a question like this one, I would probably call up the ramp positive. It's whichever one um, you feel more comfortable with. And then the y axis is perpendicular to that, which is the same direction as the normal force. This cuts out almost all of our trigonometry. Almost. Most people like to draw the free body diagram with gravity pointed straight down, like it had been on the previous slide. But most people like to work with the problem with the x-axis being horizontal and the y-axis being vertical, 
because that's how we're used to seeing our graphs, our, our xy graphs from you know from the first time you learned how to do any xy graphing back in like middle school or whatever. So as it says here, it may be really helpful to draw your free body diagram, then turn it so that you have gravity no longer pointed straight down, um, but everything else on a xy that's horizontal and vertical. It, it, you may find that to be more useful to draw it like this. Once you have yourself set up like this. Um, you want to take the force of gravity, which is the only force on this current free body diagram that's not along the x-axis and not along the y-axis. You're going to want to go ahead and break that up into the components because you know that you're going to need the, um, the vector, the force of gravity, in the x and y components. You can't just use force of gravity to add. You can't add it to anything like that. So we'll break it into a y component and an x component. I've got my dotted lines on there. And then if we add the force of friction in later, that's along the x-axis. I don't have to break that up. Like I said, if there was a rope or something involved in the question, it's probably going to be along what we've currently defined as the x-axis. So I don't have to break up anything into x and y components except the force of gravity, which I do right away at the beginning of the problem because I know I have to. An important point about doing the algebra to find the x component of the force of gravity and the y component of the force of gravity is this. If you rotate your coordinate system, meaning you have your x-axis defined as something other than horizontal and your y-axis defined as something other than perfectly vertical, then the angle that the x-axis now makes with the horizontal, which I have labeled here as theta, that is the exact same angle that the negative y-axis makes with vertical. That matters a lot because when you want to take the force of gravity, and break it into x and y components, you're going to break it up into a right triangle where the force of gravity is the hypotenuse. What you don't want to do is take that red force of gravity vector that I've drawn here and make it part of a triangle with the two blue lines that I've drawn. Those are physical things like part of the actual physical slope, and the force of gravity is a force. That's not to be added to something tangible like uh, the slope surface. The force of gravity is pointed straight down, and it is some angle from the y-axis. You want to be able to use that theta to find the y component, looking just at that red triangle that's there. So the x component of the force of gravity is the force of gravity, mg, times sine theta, because sine theta will give me the part of the force of gravity uh, that is opposite my labeled angle theta right here. And that part that is opposite is parallel to the x-axis. It happens to be, in this case, uh, pointed in the negative x direction. We'll get to that in just a second. And then the force of gravity has a y component that is mg cosine theta. Now remember, whether I'm using sine or cosine depends on which of these angles I'm calling theta. Theta could be between the force of gravity and the negative x-axis or the negative y-axis. I'm always going to pick theta to be between the force of gravity, a straight down vector, and the negative y-axis, specifically because I, that way I know exactly what that angle is. It's however many degrees my ramp is tipped up. You'll see that when we do some more example problems, I think. Okay, so we have our free body diagram for our skier in this problem, and here's how you would um, actually go through and, and make this work. My force of gravity has a y component that I would draw like this, or like this, it doesn't really matter which way I draw it, and then it has an x component that I would draw like this or like this. It doesn't really matter which way I draw it. But I have that theta there. That theta is always going to be between the force of gravity vector that points toward the center of the Earth and the negative y-axis that points in the direction that I said is negative y for this particular problem. So what do I know is happening in the x direction? I know the force of gravity x component is mg, because that's the force of gravity, times sine theta, because I did some Sokotoa algebra. And I'm putting negative here because I specifically said at the beginning of the problem that I personally like to say positive x is whichever way is, is either up and to the right or down and to the right. So that means down the ramp is the negative x direction based on the way that I defined it. What do I know is happening in the y direction? In the y direction, I know there's a normal force, but I also know there's a y component to the force of gravity. The y component of the force of gravity is also in a negative direction because it's pointed in the negative y axis direction. 
in addition to being negative, I know that it is mg because that's the force of gravity times cosine theta because, again, we did some uh, Sokotoa algebra, some trigonometry. Here's how we actually use that. I take my skier on the slope. Our first question was, if they do not push themselves, what is their acceleration on this frictionless surface? Well, in the x direction, I know that they will be accelerating because there is some force acting on them. The net force in the x direction will equal their mass times their acceleration in the x direction, Newton's second law, where I want to start every time um, with my actual calculations. What forces are adding up to be our net force in the x direction? What are all the forces happening in the x direction? I have the x component of gravity, which is negative mg sine theta, and that's it. That equals ma in the x direction. Again, where does that negative come from? It comes from the fact that I defined the positive x-axis to be up the slope, and I know that the force of gravity's x component is pointing down the slope, so that's where the negative comes in. In order to calculate what the actual acceleration is, I'm going to then solve that for the acceleration, and I get negative g sine theta. Notice the mass divided out. If you've done the 140L lab, the first week lab, then you should have determined that the mass does not matter on a frictionless surface. The acceleration would depend only on how strong gravity is and what your angle is. So negative direction g sine theta. The acceleration for this particular problem is therefore um, 4.14 meters per second per second, and it's a vector, so I do want to say down the ramp, or I could have said in a negative x direction. There was a second part to this problem. The second part was, what minimum coefficient of friction would hold this skier stationary? The friction I've drawn onto the free body diagram here, and it's pointed in what I've referred to as the positive x direction. I still have gravity pulling in the negative x direction. And the question is really asking, how strong would the coefficient of friction have to be in order for the force of friction to be as big as the x component of gravity? so that the net force in the x direction would be zero and my, my skier would not accelerate and not move. So I'm again going back to Newton's second law. I'm saying the net force in the x direction equals the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. But now the net force in the x direction is all of the forces in the x direction, so friction pointed up the slope minus the force of gravity x component pointed down the slope. I'm calling it static friction because they're asking me about how much the coefficient of friction would need to be to hold him stationary. So in order to hold the skier stationary, I need a static coefficient of friction. So the force of static friction in the positive direction minus mg sine theta in the um, negative direction equaling zero because we want our acceleration to be zero. The static friction there's an equation for that, and I want the maximum static friction. Um, so I'm talking about mu, the coefficient of friction, uh, times the normal force. So mu sub s times the normal force minus mg sine theta equals zero. And I could solve for this uh, coefficient of static friction if I knew the normal force, but I don't. So now I need to go back and look. Say the normal force is actually acting in a positive y direction. I need to solve for the normal force. I'm going to evaluate what's going on in the, in the y direction with Newton's second law. So F net in the y direction equals the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. What's F net in the y direction? All the forces in the y direction? Well, I've got the normal force pointed in a positive y direction, and I've got gravity's y component pointed in a negative y direction. So the net force is the normal force, positive, minus mg cosine theta that will equal ma and we know the skier is not accelerating in a y direction they're not accelerating up off of the slope or into the slope um, so i can now solve this for the normal force being equal to mg cosine theta and i could take that mg cosine theta and i can plug it in back on the left side where i had normal force in that equation so now mu times mg cosine theta minus mg sine theta equals zero. And when I solve that for the coefficient of static friction, I get that the coefficient of static friction is equal to mg sine theta divided by mg cosine theta, and then the m and the g will both divide out, and I wind up with the 
coefficient of static friction actually equals um, sine theta over cosine theta, which is tangent theta. If you're not sure what I did just now with that algebra, um, just walk through it yourself because it's not a lot of steps. Um, and I think walking through it will clear up any questions you had about how I did that. So the answer to our question, though, is in this problem, the minimum coefficient of friction to hold the skier stationary is going to be tangent of 25 degrees. And I get 0 0.47. Remember, there's no units for a coefficient of friction because it's a coefficient. So that is how you deal with an object on an incline. You want to change your um, axes so that the x-axis is parallel to the motion that you know is going to occur. It doesn't make your answer more right, but it takes out a huge amount of um, algebra and trigonometry that you would otherwise have to do. We will do some practice problems in an upcoming video, and this will combine in with all of the other force topics that we've talked about.